Hello everyone and welcome to tonight's event. My name's Sarah and I'm a lead teacher and developer here at Lawagon. I know that I know some of you, so welcome everyone that I've met before and all to, to those new faces as well, welcome to. And it is my absolute pleasure uh, this evening to introduce to you our special guest, Sharnali Kantaya. And Sharnali is an American filmmaker and environmental activist from New York. And her film, Coded Bias, which I guess a lot of you have just finished watching just now, premiered at the Sundance Film Festival in 2020. And not only has it won three social impact media awards for best director, best sound design, and transparency. Shalini also won the New York Women in Film and Television Award at the Hamptons International Film Festival. And these are just to mention a few of her accolades. So welcome Shalini and thanks so much for being here tonight with us. Oh, uh, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor. Brilliant. So, um, as we've been made aware tonight, uh, good intentions don't always end up with the best outcomes. And I think you would all agree that Coded Bias did a fantastic job at highlighting how unregulated technologies have created this sort of wild west in regards to their impact on society. And that we must address the need for inclusivity to be at the forefront of algorithmic design. So for anybody just tuning in now, don't worry, you're going to have access to the documentary for two weeks uh, after this event. And also this Q&A is recorded as well, so you can view it back in your own time. And I'm obviously going to be asking some questions uh, from Lawagon, but also we'd love to hear all of your questions. And there's a specific tab just next to the chat tab, there's a questions chat tab, which I will be um, moderating throughout the Q&A. So please ask all of your questions and I will do my best to make sure Shalini gets a chance to answer as many as she possibly can. So to kick things off then, Shalini, are you ready to start? Are you happy? Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> okay, so Coded Bias um, begins with Joy Bolomwini uh, in using the facial recognition technology in a project. Um, and this technology, as we all know, doesn't recognize her face. And so my question for you, just to start things off, is how did you come across Joy and her incredible story? Um, mm. and how did that, well, if, how did that um, then end up with you making the film? Uh, well, thank you so much for the question and to all of you for being part of this um, incredibly timely discussion about um, issues that will change our world in the future. I I sort of didn't know what an algorithm was or what, and everything I knew about artificial intelligence three years ago was from the mind of Steven Spielberg or Stanley Kubrick. And I sort of stumbled down the rabbit hole when I read a book called Weapons of Math Destruction by Kathy O'Neill and subsequently um, uh, saw a TED talk by Joy Bellamwini and sort of stumbled down the rabbit hole of the dark side of these uh, of big tech. And I think that, you know, coming from this background where everything I knew about artificial intelligence that I knew came from science fiction. I didn't really understand the ways in which algorithms, uh, automated models, machine learning, um, uh, artificial intelligence is really become this invisible gatekeeper, um, deciding such important things as who gets hired. Um, we're seeing now who gets the vaccine, who gets what quality of healthcare, um, and who gets undue police scrutiny. And what I began sort of grappling with is the extent to which human beings are outsourcing our autonomy to machines um, for decisions that really um, change human destiny. And I think what I learned in the making of this film and through the groundbreaking research of Joy Bellamwini and Kathy O'Neill and so many others is that these same systems that we're trusting with such precious decisions um, haven't been vetted for racial bias, for gender bias, 
uh, for discrimination, that they'll do unintended harm, and oftentimes haven't been vetted for accuracy, um, sort of in, in, in some common standard of accuracy that is not convenient for the, the company that is, um, stands to benefit economically from the technology. And that's when I began to see that everything we love as people of a democracy, um, uh, access to, to fair and accurate information, fair housing, um, fair um, elections, um, fair employment opportunities, equal oppor um, opportunities for everyone, that uh, communities of color, that black communities shouldn't uh, be subject to undue brutality and um, by law enforcement. All of those things are going to be transformed by artificial intelligence. And my fear began to sort of um, take root in the making of this film that we could roll back essentially 50 years of civil rights advances in the name of machine neutrality. And that is sort of what set me out on this journey uh, to tell this story. Brilliant. Yeah, I think that is definitely the scariest thing that came across in the film. And I definitely think a lot of people will have questions about that too. But Priya actually has a really great follow up question. And she says, what solutions do you envisage for this problem? Do you think regulation is the best way to tackle big tech and their AI? Um, what do you think is the best way to, to tackle big tech and their AI? Well, I, I love the question. Thank you for it. I mean, I think that when people ask me these things, they often want like a quick fix, like the tape over the camera. And I can tell you like, okay, blue jeans is a little bit better than Zoom and uh, Signal is a little bit better than WhatsApp. But the truth is, is that we're all operating in a world where we can't opt out of these systems. Uh, this is the only way we can be together today, and I'm so grateful to be able to have this conversation over a technology platform. I don't know how many of you uh, read the terms and conditions before you logged in. I certainly did not. And so what I feel strongly, which is an inconvenient answer to your question, <laughs> is that we need policy, that we need a systematic change all the laws that we have um, in the United States that govern big tech were essentially invented before the internet. <laughs> we, don't, we don't have that many legislations that govern technology after the advent of the internet. And so we're operating as a wild, wild west. And what I hope to show in Coded Bias is that data rights are civil rights data rights are human rights. And I think that I didn't understand, I, I had this disconnect when people start to put it in terms of privacy. Privacy feels, feels like a nice to have, but if I'm not hiding anything, it's okay if I don't have privacy. But the more accurate word that I would use to describe what the kind of information uh, that say Facebook has about us or that Google has about us is invasive surveillance. These technology companies have the kind of information about us that make the East German Stasi look like they had a light touch, like they were cute. The Stasi was cute, the kind of practices that they were implementing. And um, we haven't yet looked at that as people of a democracy. As, of what does it mean that we're increasingly picking up the tools of an authoritarian state? And what I've also come to see is the power that we have as citizens in this moment when we push for systematic change. So first I would say that you can go to the Coded Bias website and there's a take action page and there's about a dozen incredible organizations that are doing work in the field who are operating with very little resources who could need your support and not just financial support. You can sign a petition, you can get involved. Um, and there are organizations that I have seen, witnessed, uh, make incredible change with very little um, resources. You have three people, young people um, at Big Brother Watch 
essentially holding back um, the Metropolitan Police from real-time use of facial recognition. So we have a moonshot moment. I, I just wanna say here that I believe so strongly we make change, even though code of bias is a wake-up call and can be terrifying, that I saw sea change in the making of this film that I never thought possible which is that I saw the three biggest technology companies in the world, three of the biggest technology companies in the world, change their policy around the sale of, of facial recognition to law enforcement. Um, IBM literally got out of the facial recognition game. They won't research it, deploy it, they're done. Um, Microsoft says they won't sell it to police facial recognition and Amazon said they would put a one year pause. And that was sea change we never thought was possible uh, and that came about because of, of two things. One is, um, or, or three, I would say. One is um, brave scientific research like Joy's. Three black women scientists who were graduate students essentially found bias in AI that three of the biggest multinationals missed. That in itself is a, a um, is a rally cry for why inclusion isn't just good for the pictures, but it makes us more competitive in the industries of the future. But then you had um, the, this sea change happened in June of 2020. And that's significant because that's not when the research came out. The research came out a year and a half prior. But that's when you have the largest movement for civil rights and equality that we've seen uh, in my city of New York and everywhere across the country um, calling for racial justice. And you had people making the link between um, racially biased invasive surveillance in the hands of law enforcement and the inherent value of black life and how one could be jeopardizing the other. And that sea change was made possible because of those two things. So we have a, rep a recipe, which is, uh, which is science, independent science unencumbered by corporate interests and engaged citizens in a democracy who are acting on that science. And, and that is a recipe for social change. That being said, as long as it's up to big tech to decide on their own, our democracy is on trouble. As long as they can pick up the tools of an authoritarian state with no one we elected. The, what is astounding, I just want to reiterate about Joy's research um, is, you know, she's just a grad student trying to make a Snapchat filter work for an art project. Yeah, of right? she, just, uh, she didn't, she didn't want to stumble upon this, but this was technology that's not on a shelf somewhere. It was already being sold to the FBI, already being sold to ICE, already being, deployed oftentimes in, by police all across the country. And so we need laws and we need policy. And that comes from we the people being informed about how these systems work, supporting organizations that are making systematic change and hitting up our legislators. Sometimes I wanna tweet into, the, into, the, into my realm of people who agree with me. And instead I'm like, let me hit up Schumer real quick and just send him a note about how I feel about this. <laughs> And so I think the more that we can engage and support organizations towards systematic change and policy and towards policies that protect us by way of us being human, having inalienable rights around tech, um, that's the way to be. And so it is a, a bigger haul, but we can get there. I really believe we have a moonshot moment to get there. Yeah, and I would definitely agree that I think for me, the moment with the Atlantic Plaza Towers, uh, everybody that every uh, was living there, that really felt like a black mirror moment when I was hearing about their lives and being video recorded and things like that. So when you talk about the legalities behind these things, you're so right, that is exactly what we need. Um, so we have a lot of da aspiring data scientists on the call because we're a coding mm -hmm. camp. So um, there, I think we, eight almost in their in their developing journey. Um, so a question based on that then, um, AI is like forward looking, but is based on past data. And I know it was either Kathy O'Neill or Joy Bulamwini who mentioned this. And the past 
dwells with dwells within our algorithms. So, what ways have you come across um, that data scientists are attempting to unskew this biased data? Mm -hmm. Such a great question, and I love speaking with data scientists. I'm always super humbled because I often pose the question to them: Are we creating deterministic models when we're using past data? that we know is ridden with historic inequalities to predict the future. Um, I can tell you in my own past, I can't imagine that there's any data that would suggest I would go on to be a documentary filmmaker um, or, or, or would predict that. There's no algorithm that would have predicted that. So I think that's a question until itself. In terms of like controlling for bias, I think there's a few, few things. I mean, I think that um, people are beginning to question what Joy calls pale male data, um, uh, data that's based on a um, what she calls the oversampled minority of people. And she and other data scientists even point to um, inequalities at NIST in our national standards around data being skewed towards uh, white male data. So I think part of it is around, you know, um, what data scientists tell me is around looking at the integrity of the data. But I think that with coded bias, I'm attempting to ask a deeper question, which inconveniences a lot of data scientists. <laughs> I think technologists always want to look at it as sort of like, we're just going to create the perfect algorithm. We'll get the data all cleaned up. It was just a problem with the data and we'll create the perfect algorithm without thinking about, then we'll have perfect invasive surveillance. And I, I just want to recognize that I know that data scientists and engineers and even the ones, some of the ones that were responsible for systems, um, I had someone at my Sundance screening who who was in the who was one of the engineers who, that created Tay, that was this oh, wow, um, really? curiosity of an anti-Semitic robot. Um, I always joke that all the swear words in the film are from the AI. <laughs> um, but but even that person loved the film because they understood that this was a bias that was being encoded. But I think the larger question is, the person who's encoding for facial recognition is might be thinking around, oh, this is great. We're gonna use this for to detect early onset of autism. And it's not thinking about the other uses. And I think my concern is actually that data scientists have too much power. And that Kathy O'Neill says, data scientists are making decisions that should actually be made by civil society, policymakers, and ethicists. And and the, the engineers and the coders should just be coding. And I think part of it is, I think I've seen this new wave of data scientists who are at universities who are saying, we need an ethics course in data science. We need a black studies course. We need a woman's studies course. How can we be programming for society and we don't know anything about society? And I think that um, to me, it's not just about I mean, I think part of it is also like, um, I, I will tell you that I have a lot more compassion for bias itself. We're having this national conversation about bias. And I think there's this like kind of impetus to be like, oh, bias is in a few bad police officers or in a few bad people. And I think what I came to grapple with in the making of coded bias is that Bias is an innate human condition that we all have, regardless of race, gender, orientation, religion, socioeconomic background. It's just what kind of bias. And the more that we can shine a light into these dark places in our own biases, it means that as scientists, it's something that you have to control for. And not just once, as Joy says, it's it, that bias, controlling for bias is like hygiene. You don't do it once in one day and say, we did it, <laughs> we're done. It's, it's something that we have to put checks on and that comes through creating more inclusive teams, not just around race and gender. I mean, the fact that 14% women 
our AI researchers are, is that's an abysmal statistic. It shouldn't be allowed to exist in 2021. And I don't even have statistics on people of color. And these are systems that are deployed on all of us. And so um, part of it is around creating inclusive teams. Some of it is around vetting the data. Some of it is around including a broader swath of society that includes independent researchers, independent ethicists, people who don't have a vested interest in, in economically in your technology. Uh, we need people who are thinking of the Black Mirror episode because um, it, we've seen time and time again, in spite of the best intentions of the engineers, that bias gets encoded. And once it's deployed at scale, um, it's really hard to put it back in the, in, in, in the box. And I've seen firsthand the harms that it can cause. Um, I have seen firsthand civil liberties um, be in danger uh, okay. because of these technologies. And so to me, it is it realizing the power that you have and trying to put some checks um, at every stage of, of the product's development. So we actually have an inter uh, we have a poll for the people watching just on what you were just talking about uh, about the impact of what these algorithms can do and our poll for you would be um, having watched the documentary because now you have more of an understanding of how these algorithms can work and we know that you might not know whether you've been affected by data bias before but hopefully now watching coded bias you have a feel for what that can look like so our poll is having watched the documentary do you believe that you may have been affected by data bias so there's three different answers that you can put and it's just in the poll section it'd just be interesting to hear um, to see what our listeners think so yes don't know or no and we'll come back to that um, in just a moment but let's ask some of our questions in the questions tab so again, just going off what you have just been talking about, Shalini, and about government su surveillance and mm -hmm. that topic, uh, Celine says, how do you think we can find a balance between government surveillance that is biased and inaccurate and an invasion of privacy and the security and safety of the public? Mm, I love a question. I just, I just want to say that to me, it is ultimately about who gets to decide. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, these are very powerful technologies. A lot of these technologies, if picked up by authoritarian regimes or nefarious bad actors, uh, could go really wrong. And to me, the question I'm trying to ask with coded bias is who gets to decide? Who gets to make these decisions? And right now it's big tech in collusion with law enforcement <laughs> and that doesn't seem right it feels to me like someone that represents we the people um someone that represents our voice as an elected official that is accountable to us um for our rights should be involved in that process and that means our policymakers have to be educated you have sitting senators asking mark zuckerberg how Facebook makes money. And Mark Zuckerberg has to say, um, Senator, we sell ads. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that can't be allowed. Um, that can't be allowed given Facebook's stake in our society and the ways in which it's transforming our world. Um, our policymakers have to have some sense of um, what's happening with these technologies. And what, what's happening is that they're getting deployed before we can um, legislate them before there's safety in place. And what I often say, um, I love Kathy O'Neill's um, idea for an FDA for algorithms. Yes, of course. Because it's it's not like I don't like food. I, I love food. <laughs> I just believe in an FDA because I think there should be a certain standard of safety and a certain standard of health for our technology. And, and I really believe that we need something like that. I can't vet a technology, but Kathy O'Neill can. And so I feel like we need some sort of regulatory body before technologies go from big tech to our children's hands. 
Of course, and it was really impressive. I mean, the the final scene in um, Capitol Hill, and when you that um, Joy is speaking with Alexandra Ocasio Cortez is just such an inspiring moment, and the way that actually Ocasio Cortez questions Joy is. I think that scene in the movie was just so inspirational and I was so pleased that you had made this movie that really depicts an image of strong women in tech um, speaking out about change that is needed with, uh, with biased data. Um, so on that then, what would you say, so the documentary has obviously accomplished tons of awards you've won awards for it but what would you say your personal proudest moment has mm -hmm. been through making this documentary well i love that i will say that um i've come to believe that women are an untapped genius for change within silicon valley i didn't set out to make a film that was is uh, mostly women and people of color. It just happened. It, it, it happened that way because the research kept leading me back to these voices. And what I realized is that there's been a long history of women, people of color, LGBTQ, religious minorities, um, people who have been historically marginalized um, and also are genius data scientists and mathematicians with advanced degrees so not only can they understand the science and translate it to lay people like me, which I'm so grateful for, but they had an experience that wasn't centered. They were on the margins of society and that they were able to shine a light into bias that the tech bros missed. And I yeah. think that one of the things I'm proudest of um, is that with coded bias, I have had literally hundreds of conversations across the country about AI focused um, almost primarily on women. And I'm so deeply proud of that because I believe that women are an untapped source I, um, of imagination. When I look at now um, this sort of, even this idea of inclusion, which can be sort of thought of, of like, that's good for the people who are left out, you know, to include them. And that's good for the pictures. What I've come to realize is that it's really important and strategic um, that we include uh, voices that, that are reflective of our world. Okay. Um, and there's a different kind of genius and, um, you know, in the making of this film, I sort of learned also that there's been this dialogue between science fiction writers and, and the people who um, invent the technology. And both of those, the, both of the imagination around these technologies have been invented by men. I've often joked that how, there's so many fantasies about um, men who fall in love with their AI, you know, because <laughs> women, women are complicated, you know, and so um, including one of my favorite films, Blade Runner. Um, and, and so, but I think women will have a different imagination about how these technologies can be used and can play a critical role in changing in the future. So I'm really grateful um, to be a part of that change. Yeah, and I think just because women haven't been past or uh, haven't been a part of this past um, building of AI, they obviously can be a part of the future and they should be. And I think you've done a really good job of demonstrating that. And you've actually asked, answered Nena's question as well. Was it inten intentional to involve so many women in your documentary? You gave a really interesting answer to that. I thought the answer might be yes, but you're, that's not correct at all. I was wrong. <laughs> actually leading this. this. That's actually who's leading this. You know, I just didn't understand what a uh, revolutionary act that would be because my gender ratios are about the same as other technology films. They're just flipped. And we're so used to men being the authority yeah. on the technologies that will govern our future that if we had just replaced all the women's voices, if we'd flipped the gender, gender ratios and there had been like, you know, one or two uh, women in the film, I don't think an audience would have flinched. We're so used to this, uh, what Joy calls sort of, 
well, it's not a minority, but the other thing is that women are not minorities. We yeah. would never know okay. about that in our in our uh, representation in, in the technologies that would govern our future. So I'm, I'm grateful to be part of that because it really is about unleashing a different kind of genius and imagination around these technologies. Definitely. And interestingly, so our poll that we did before, having watched the documentary, do you believe you've been affected by data bias? Um, interestingly, 76% of people have said yes, which is really quite a lot of people. I wasn't sure which way that would go, because obviously you might not be aware of the fact that you are a victim of data bias, but it sounds like a lot of people have. Um, so Xavier has a question. As, aspiring, as an aspiring data scientist and also a cis white male, what can he do more um, to what can I do to more importantly train myself to identify and call out or erase bias in my work? Oh, I really love this question and thank you for asking it. And I think that um, we all need to create environments where it's safe to ask the question and where it's safe for him to ask, how can I support, what can I do? And it's safe for other people. And I think sometimes, it can be something as simple as repeating what a woman just said. <laughs> it sounds crazy, but if you notice it in a room and she's not being heard, it could be, wait a minute, did we just hear that? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think there's, there's something like that, but I think within companies, we must create a culture where our diversity is our strength, because it is, it allows us to see into our own biases. And so, um, you know, the different ways in which we see are actually assets that we're bringing to the work. And I think that we need to create cultures where dissent is welcome, where it's a safe space. I have seen so many well-meaning people who work at Facebook work at Google and they see something and they don't know what to do. Um, or they don't wanna lose their job, but they see something. And, and I think that we are all in a place where we have to listen closely to our own North Star, to our own moral compass. And I think that the more that we can create an environment where voices of dissent, where marginalized people can speak freely, I think the better it can be. It could be that you need an anonymous box at your job. Um, I know that I started to, uh, when, we, when I used to lecture live, I, I would sometimes realize that it was all men speaking. And at the end of the conversation, I would just leave a moment and I would just say, I just want to acknowledge that the distance to the microphone isn't the same for everyone. And I would like to leave space for any woman who wants to speak. Literally, they, I would get bum rushed because there would just be women sitting and waiting and listening and not speaking. And the more that we can just create that open space, I just want to hold that space for anyone who's not spoken. I think that could, it, it really makes a, a big difference for who's heard and not heard. But, um, and, and also it, it's what Joy said, it, it's not gonna get solved on one day. We have to keep doing this all the time. It's yes, really- sure. And I yeah. think your film as well, it, it just has so many female role models in it. I think I only became aware of it sort of halfway through, just a light bulb moment, like, wait a second. <laughs> There are so many women, and you say that there are so many PhDs in your film as well, that who are, again, women too, um, and it's very inspirational. Um, so at La Wagon, we are training um, the next generation of data scientists, and what we'd like to know is, what advice would you give us to make sure that we incorporate ethics and all of the issues raised in Coded Bias into our teaching content? Mm. Um, well, you know, it's, it's such a good question and it's a question that doesn't end on one day. It'll, I hope mm -hmm. it happens on, 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 um, 
many days inside of your company that you have regular meetings about this that isn't just it's it's a it's a perpetual something i think it helps sometimes to write it into the mission of what you're doing um, to actually make a statement and say this is what we're committing to doing as a as a people and this is how we'll do it i think that that is a uh, perpetual step um I think some of the things that I, I've, I've touched on, it, um, which is, you know, this, which you know better than I do around vetting uh, data, creating a more inclusive culture, bringing broader swaths of society and outside third party people into the conversation. But I also just want to say that we have to think about the larger implications of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And for me, I think the reframe that I have for technologists is it's not about creating a perfect algorithm. It's about creating a more humane society. And how can we create systems um, that can be transparent, that can, that are not black boxes that we can sort of discern how a decision was made um, that are transparent to us, that are accountable in some way if there's a mistake, how hard is it to get a human being on the phone or, um, you know, or um, we saw we saw instances where AI replaced social workers and a million people who are qualified didn't, didn't get health benefits that they needed because um, of, of not having a human in the loop that cared for them, that helped them through that process. And so to me, I hope that we go through through this reframe because Eli Pariser, who was, was talking about, uh, tweeted that um, he's gone to so many conferences about the future of technology and not enough about the future of humanity. Yeah. And what I hope we do is this larger reframe around what does it mean to build technology um, that is based on the inherent value of every human being. And is the goal of life really to be as efficient as possible, to go as fast as possible? Yeah. Is that really the goal? Because oftentimes your work is framed around that. How do we be as efficient? How do we go as fast? How do we make it? Is that, and, and we have to look, roll that back a little bit and say, as a design question, how do we value the inherent value of every human being? How do we make the system transparent? How do we make it accountable? How do we put a human in the loop in case something goes wrong? And I think the more that we can start to ask those questions um, that are not easily answered, the more that we can um, create a more uh, human-centered technology. Definitely. Um, and I know we've been asking some very difficult, <laughs> deep questions about AI and the future of AI. Something that I think we'd all really like to know is I, I myself have not been to the cinema in a year because of the pandemic. pandemic. Um, what sort of difficulties did you face premiering uh, remotely and filming remotely and things like that? So how, well, I think, I guess the filming took place a, a while ago. But. I was really lucky. I was so lucky. <laughs> that filming was done by the time that COVID happened. And I was further incredibly fortunate that I got to premiere at Sundance 2020, which might be the last festival that there ever is <laughs> in terms of uh, I really festival. hope not. <laughs> I, I know. I mean, it, there are other festivals, but in that traditional sense where yeah. I got to see my film in the theater with the audience. And, and that was important because I recut my film subsequently based on that, um, uh, based on sitting with the audience and sort of understanding um, what the reaction is and seeing faces. But I would say the strength is to be able to have conversations like this one, maybe more all around the world because, um, because of COVID, you know, that, that maybe I'm in five cities at one time instead of others. But I will say there's a special kind of magic that happens when we're all together. I know. And the lights come up. Uh, 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 to me, 
my work starts when the lights come up on my movie. Like when the lights come up on my movie and the audience is sitting there with you and they've just taken in what you've shared with them and they, and they say, what can I do? How does this change my life? And to me, this happens in smaller ways through conversations like this one where we where, where we're get together in this cyberspace. But it also speaks to the urgency of what we're doing because we don't have a public square. I call it I call it the sacred space of, of the cinema hall, the independent cinema hall, um, because um, Roger Ebert, the great film critic, called called cinema film empathy machines, and it it speaks to why I make films because um, and also what we're talking about in technology because I believe what makes us human and the great power that we have is in our empathy for other human beings. And what cinema does is it allows you to sit in the dark with other strangers and have this deep experience of empathy for someone who's radically different than you in case, in this case, Joy and Kathy and, and Silky and all of these incredible women. And I think through our hearts being moved, is actually the spark of, of, of social change. It's actually not because we know something, but because we feel something um, that is that spark of social change. And I think now that public square of the cinema hall is moving to Zoom, is moving to Google Hangout. Yeah. And so we have to, we have to actually um, call um, on these platforms to reflect our democratic ideals because our public square is moving from these community centers and cinema halls and um, town councils to spaces like this. And so it's more important than ever that these spaces, um, uh, requ you know, sort of get encoded with our democratic values. Definitely. And I know that we've all um, had to change our ways a lot with the pandemic. And I'm, it sounds like you have too. Um, would you also say that the pandemic has exacerbated algorithmic injustices? Or would you think that's not the case? Oh, absolutely. Without a question of doubt. I mean, all you have to do is look at Jeff Bezos's net worth. He's on track to be the world's first trillionaire. Um, Facebook and Amazon have consolidated power. They're the only companies that have been, not the only, that's un untrue and I want to stick to true, but, but they, they are companies that have continued to grow um, in sort of an outsized way uh, during the crisis. And so their power has gotten even bigger. And we're seeing it even with the income inequality around big tech and other things. So absolutely, um, it's, 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 um, consolidated our reliance on these platforms and made it more and more important that they that we have some civil rights and human rights around their use. Definitely. And um, Magali in the questions has also said, what do you think technology teams can do to avoid propagating bias in the technology as it exists in the world? I feel like we've we've sort of t touched a little yeah. bit on sort of what we can do a little bit, um, but it's my hope that until there's like an FDA, that you'll hire outside ethicists and you'll make sure your teams are diverse and you'll and there will be a more stringent uh, vetting system before these technologies go to scale. Definitely. And um, OK, so if any of you have further questions, definitely continue to ask them in the questions tab. We have an, one final poll for you as well before we start uh, wrapping up. But do ask. We've still got about 15 minutes, so keep your questions coming. And our next poll is then which of the following is most concerning to all of you? So would it be voice recognition? facial recognition or the selling of behavioral data? Because obviously the film talks most in depth about facial recognition technology, but of course touches on other types of technology too. So which types would you say are the most, well, scary for our future, would you say, and to democracy, I guess, as well? 
let's have a look at what people think about that. And then Yasmin asks a good question of how do you create more exposure um, of things that are covered in coded bias, all of the topics covered, so that it coincides with the mainstream platforms? Because I know you tweeted about the fact that it would be really great if um, corporates, if this could be um, sort of funded by a corporate in a corporate world. Um, but so how do you think we can put this more on mainstream platforms? Oh, well, I really hope that people will share the film. Yeah. Um, I think that all of the knowledge about AI has been in the hands of the few. And I think that you as technologists may not realize the power that you have. Um, all of the people in my film who successfully challenged these systems talked about the fear they had about feeling dumb, uh, feeling uh, like an imposter, feeling like they didn't have the expertise to question these systems. I mean, if you look at Trine Moran at ICMA Downs, um, they didn't even know what biometric data was when they um, when their landlord tried to put it in their building. Yeah. And had to educate themselves. And, and even myself, even though I have advanced degrees and, and, and some accolades, I was fearful. Oh my goodness, I'm going to um, use algorithms or machine learning or AI. I'm gonna have improper usage of those three terms and everyone's gonna dismiss my research and laugh at me. Like people have real fear around being able to even talk about these issues. And that is because you may not realize the power you have as data scientists and mathematicians, that all of the knowledge has been in the hands of the few, so all of the power has been in the hands of the few. And one of the things I hoped to do with Coded Bias was just level the playing field and create a place. My favorite comments were like, my immigrant grandma loved your film. My 10 year old daughter loved your film, you know? And I love those comments because we start, kids start using this as at age 10. At age 10, we should have some basic literacy. And I think the more that you as data scientists and uh, mathematicians remove your jargon, stop talking to only yourselves, and start talking to people. What do you think about this? Is this like this? And the more that we can start to put this in a common, and now I've sat with all the teams, you know, I'm an artist with no training in this. I've sat with all the teams from Stanford, all the major tech companies, self-driving cars. I've talked with everyone and they're interested in my point of view as a misfit um, because I have a genius that maybe is not in the room. And so we have to start thinking about the genius, the different kinds of intel intelligence that are in the room. And that also means that not everybody maybe went to Stanford. Maybe you have some people from San Jose State. Um, maybe you have some people who, who come from a different socioeconomic background. And I think that, um, I hope that we can create a culture of basic literacy because these technologies in, influence both of us. And, and I think as technologists, you can play an important role in spreading literacy. And I hope that you will use the film. I created the film to it. And I just wanna add on the Coded Bias Take Action website, there is an activist toolkit. There's a discussion guide that actually has a basic glossary of terms um, vetted by someone who was not me um, that, that basically sort of vets those terms so that people have a, a, a common language so they feel like they can challenge that technology, they can ask the question, and they have the authority to do so. And I think that's really useful for us because all of us, I guess, are here because we want to know what we can do as individuals as well as a collective. Um, so that sounds like a really good idea. We all need to go and go on the Coded Bias website and check it out. Um, so let's just have two more questions to wrap things up then. So I, we've mentioned that there are lots of data science students here, um, 
if they wanted to do a data documentary tomorrow, just like you following your footsteps, how would you say they should go about um, starting something like that? How did you begin? Oh, for data scientists who want to make a documentary. I mean, this is actually what I do all day. So you don't have to do this. <laughs> I don't do what you do. You don't have to do what I do. Um, but I do think it's important to have some sort of dialogue with society that's perpetual, that's ongoing, that can be. Um, and I think the more that you can these days, um, so Steven Soderbergh uses this phone. They're, 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 they're like three films that he made that are actually look amazing um, that are on Netflix now that were shot on his phone. And I think the more you can make little films that explain things, um, I think that is a great way to sort of engage. But it's also my hope that you won't, I spent two years making a film so you won't have to. <laughs> that you'll actually use this film um, to sort of, um, uh, use it as a tool to talk to people. Okay, brilliant. And what would you say, like, if there's one thing that we take away from your documentary, what would you say that is? I guess there are lots of different things. I think there are a few things. I think that it's this question around what intelligence is. I think I would call us to think deeper because to me, I think we've, we've even used this word intelligence around some things and not around others, around um, you know a machine that can solve chess is called intelligence, but somehow women aren't always called <laughs> that. And so I feel like what, what I want to help people understand is that uh, bias is, is an is a inherent condition and that Our real value as human beings is that we can empathize and that we can um, and, and and that if you if you don't have empathy or compassion, that you can't be intelligence. That's not actually intelligence. That 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 those are things that that are valuable and that should be valued in our systems. And I think if there's one takeaway it would be that data rights are human rights. That um, that actually when you're encoding, you have the actual power to, to, to alter how someone experiences their civil rights, their human rights, um, the way that their data is used. And I think the more that we realize that and we realize it's not about creating the perfect algorithm, that efficiency isn't always the goal, yeah. that um, we need to create systems that value the inherent value, the inherent value of every human being. And I think that, that sometimes might disrupt the business model, but I hope that you will. Yeah, that's a brilliant way to finish. And one last thing then, just so that we get excited for following your future, what are you looking to work on at the moment? Or is there something that you're currently working on that we can look forward to? Well, I will say that I can announce that Coded Bias will be on PBS uh, on Independent Lens on March 22nd. So you can share that with all of your colleagues and it will, um, be, it's the first national release um, of the film. So I'm hoping that you will share that. Um, and then I will have a Nova special on April 14th, um, specifically about information and around our information systems and search engines that's coming out. And um, I'm working on a sci-fi um, right now. And so I'm looking for other ways to reach new audiences through art. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your time. I've really enjoyed it. And I'm sure that everybody watching as well at home uh, has really enjoyed listening to your answers to all of their questions. So thanks so much for being with us tonight. And I look forward to seeing what you do in the future as well. So thank you. Thank you so much for hosting this conversation. It's such an honor. Brilliant. Well,